answer in a bottle. You'll never find your answer in the world. But Jesus said, if you'll come to me, all ye that are laboring and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. All you need is Jesus Christ. His presence being here today. Yay, Amen. Amen. I thank yeah. God for Brother Danny you for your and his wife Shannon being with us all the way from Tennessee. You, They've been with us all weekend and it has been a privilege and honor. This man right here will never know what he means to me. And he, he's, just a, he's just a man of God, a great mouthpiece for the Lord in the time that we're living in right now. He is an ambassador of the kingdom of God. And so is his wife. Amen. And so is Sister Shannon. And I give God praise. We're here to celebrate what God has done in this house. This is homecoming, son. But we're here. Oh, so yeah. like, oh, yeah. Yeah. We're here. I thank God. Me and Angie and Sister Judy was trying to look through this and, and try to figure this out. I'm the fifth pastor that's pastored this house. And I thank God for the men that set the course for this house to cross. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Great ambassadors for the Lord. Great men of God for the Lord. For the Lord. Amen. And it's a great honor to be here today to celebrate. And I'm thinking we've got 66 years. Somewhere there Somewhere between 66 years that this house has been here. Right. Amen. Amen. It's been established. And I prophesy this in the, in, over this house, and I prophesy all time. The devil thought he won the victory. Amen. When, when they said we couldn't do this. Amen. But my Bible tells me that the gates of hell shall not prevail against this house. It did then. And it's not now. Can somebody shout out? to admonish you and encourage you to always guard that. Be pure with the presence of God. Because it really is the thing that makes a difference. There's a lot of churches in the land. There's a lot of struggling churches. There's a lot of quote-unquote prosperous churches. But my concern is, is that there's not a lot of Holy Ghost charged and led yeah. churches. Yeah. But you have that here. Yeah. And it is a great testament to the leaders you have in this house. Phenomenal leaders in this house. And I would encourage you to honor them and respect them because of their hunger for the presence of God. And their willingness to lead you into that. Because 
that's what makes a difference in our lives. Amen. Put your hands up toward heaven one more time. Father, we honor you. We praise you. We thank you for the good Holy Ghost that is with us in this room. Lord, we believe that in this environment that all things are possible to us who believe. And Lord, I believe that there is some believers in this house today. And we will see what's in the impossible realm come over into the realm of possibility. Lord, we thank you that as the word of God goes forth, that signs, wonders, and miracles will break out amongst your people. And Lord, let us leave this place today changed, forever changed. By the word of the Lord and the presence of God, and we will say that it's been good to be in the house of God. And Lord, lastly, but certainly not least, I believe that I'm sowing good seed on good ground. And as a result, I'm not just expecting a 30 or a 60 fold return, but a hundred fold return. The seed of the word of God coming forth in this place amongst this great people. In Jesus' mighty name, all of God's people shouted, Amen. In the presence of the Lord. I'm going to back up just a little bit right here. Again, so good to see you this morning. I have been looking forward to this, not just the service, but uh, I'll, I'll keep talking. They can adjust it. Or I need to adjust the height of this. You think? Okay. All right. Praise God. I've been looking forward to this service, uh, but not just the service, but time with your pastors. Amen. They have become such dear friends, and it's people that I wish that I lived uh, a little bit. I was in closer proximity to. <laughs> because, you know, the longer I live and the more I walk, in the kingdom of God, walk in the things of the Spirit, the more I've discovered what you're in close proximity to really does matter. I was meditating, and I'll I'll take a text here in a moment, but I'll be saying something before you would think I'm saying something if you'll hear me. But I was meditating on this idea this morning that it really doesn't matter who and what you're in close proximity to. And I was reminded of a story I read about back some time ago uh, in a book where in the 17th century there was a clockmaker by the name of Christian Hyman. And Christian Hyman was the maker of the pendulum clock. He developed or invented the first pendulum clock. And one night as he was laying in his bed admiring his awesome clock collection, What he noticed is that out of all of the clocks, all of the pendulums were swinging together in unison. Every one of them. And he thought, now wait a minute, I did not set these clocks for the pendulums to swing together in sync or in unison. So intentionally, he got out of the bed and he reset the pendulums on them clocks where they would not be swinging in sync. So the next morning, he wakes up, and to his surprise, again, all of the pendulums, they were swinging together in unison. They were swinging together in sync. Now, during his lifetime, he never discovered this, but it was discovered after Mr. Hyman had went on that what happens is that all of the pendulums in the clock, they come into sync or into harmony with the largest clock. And so the largest clock in the room had the ability to cause all of the pendulums to swing together in unison with them. It matters who and what you're in close proximity. And when you stay close to Jesus and you stay close to his people, your life will always be in sync with heaven. Let me try that one more time. When you stay in close proximity to Jesus and his people, your life will always be in sync with heaven. And I would encourage you that if you want to be an eagle saint, you can't hang out with a bunch of chickens pecking around in the dust. I'm still impressed to say this. They may be some folk in the room. You're, You're hanging with a rowdy crowd. And at the end of the day, that 
that will do you no good because it has the ability, the largest voices in your life have the ability to pull you to sink with them. Oh, Hang out with Jesus. Thank you, sir. Hang out with Holy Ghost filled people Amen. and your life will be in sync. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I want to hang out with Holy Ghost filled, on fire for God yeah, type yeah. people. Amen. Because that's what I want in my life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So I love you, sir. I love you, Pastor Angie. Thank, you. Thank you so Amen. much for being good to me. Yeah. Brother Sam was a blessing to me yesterday. <laughs> Taught me how to bass fish a little bit better, so my life has been blessed by Brother Sam, but the the, uh, the hospitality has been good, and I'll try not to be very, very long this morning. I want to obey the Spirit of God, and I will yeah, never leave us the things of the yeah. Spirit short, but Amen. I know we got some good groceries next door, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, of course, I love to eat, so praise God. Let's speak from the Word first, yeah. and then if you would take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Psalms while you're turning there, I'm so blessed, as always, to have my beautiful wife, Shannon, yeah. Yeah. with me. Psalms 46, this coming August, we'll celebrate uh, celebrate 26 years in marriage and ministry. I turned 47 last Tuesday. She turned 47 on the 16th of June. She's four days older than me. And I used to sing that song to her that older women make beautiful lovers. <laughs> I don't know how much she appreciates that. It's free nonetheless. <laughs> but I'm so thankful for her and her life. She is just such a precious individual. And uh, I love her real big, real big. Amen. She's been a tremendous, tremendous voice in my life. A voice of reason. Yeah. A voice of reason. You know, you can't always surround yourself with people telling you everything you want to hear. That's right. And sometimes it's it's the hardest to hear the things you need to hear from the people that's the closest to you. That's right. But those close covenantal relationships that are in your life, yes. those are the voices that really matter. Living in a day of social media where everybody seemingly has a voice, uh, at the end of the day, there's a lot of voices we need to be tuning out. But I would encourage you that those that you know that you're in covenant with, to give your ear to those voices being the loudest in your life. And they may not always tell you what you want to hear, but they will tell you what you need to hear. Amen. And help you get where you need to go. Yeah. Make one more statement right here, and then we'll dive into this text. But I feel like I'm in the name of the Spirit right now. Oh, yeah. Terminology that was used for Eve when God created Adam, the King James uses this terminology to help meet. Yeah. Everybody say meet. meet. That's the terminology that the King James uses. Yeah. We know that's a help meet, but just to use a little bit of a, a play on of words for a prophetic picture. What our spouses are designed to do is help us meet our destiny. They are our help meet. And when you're in covenant with somebody like that, they help you meet the destiny that God has for you. And so I'm grateful for my family. I really thought uh, initially that Carter Joe, our daughter, would be with us on this trip, and that was the intention. But uh, Carter Joe is at a youth camp in Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. It's an annual youth camp they have every year. It's very, very powerful. Yeah. And for years they have done it uh, and, and during a particular time, a particular week in June. But for some reason this year they changed the week. And so that kind of altered her course. But uh, she just turned 12 and this is her first year in going. And it's such an, a powerful Holy yeah. Ghost environment yeah. there. That we are so thankful that she's going to be there this yes, morning. Uh, because we feel very, very strong about investing in our seed. Yes. There's no greater investment in the gospel. Yes. But because of my relationship with these guys of this local church, I, I have a sneaky suspicion in the Holy Ghost. I will see you again. Yes. And you will be Carter Joe Phillips. Yes. Psalms 46, if you have to say amen. 
Amen. Look with me in verse number three. We'll read two verses there and then jump over to uh, the book of John and read a couple of verses there. Tonight, if you'll help, I'll give a list of scriptures. And I'm sorry I didn't think to do that. Yes, okay. The Psalms 46 and verse number three says, Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah, which just means to yes. pause and think about it. Uh, yes. Watch verse number four. I love this. Yes. Uh, there is a river. Yes. Yes. Everybody say, there is a river. There is yes. a river. Yes. Yes. There is a river. The streams whereof shall make glad the city of God. The holy place of the tabernacles. Of the most high. If you will look over in the book of John, chapter number seven. John the seventh chapter. Look with me around verse 36. <clears throat> John chapter number seven and verse number thirty-six. Look with me at thirty-seven. John 7, 37, in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, yes, let him come unto me and drink. Now notice this. He that believeth on me, yes. as the scripture has said, yes. out of his belly or his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water, but this spake he of the Spirit, yes. which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Right. Notice this last line, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. There is a river. John chapter number 7 Verse 37, it tells us in the last day, that great day of the feast. Most of the time when we think about the river, the Spirit of God, that equating to the Spirit of God, we think of the feast of Pentecost. Because in Acts chapter number 2, the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. But when the scripture says in the last day, the great day of the feast, this particular feast here that's being referenced is not the feast of Pentecost, but rather the feast of Tabernacles. Now I want to make one statement about this, and uh, I, I, I really don't have a lot of time to qualify this particular statement, but... There is a lot of emphasis in the day we live in on last days, last time harvest, last this, last that. And I don't know about all that. Come on, bro. But what I do know about is that we are standing in a great day. Yes. And prophetically speaking, we are standing in a day where we are to experience as believers the greatest things that the children of Israel can celebrate and experience, and that is the Feast of Tabernacles. And if you look at things prophetically speaking, there were three primary feasts that the children of Israel celebrated, which was Passover, Pentecost, and the Feast of Tabernacles. Passover commemorated at the death of the Lamb in Exodus chapter number 12. Pentecost was commemorated 50 days after, again, the day that the Spirit fell. The Feast of Tabernacles was the last annual feast that they celebrated, the end gathering of the harvest. In other words, the harvest had finally matured and had come to a place of reaping. So when you look at this uh, from a prophetic point of view, Passover representing to us our new birth. We've been washed in the blood. Yeah. We've had an encounter yeah. with the Lamb. Yeah. Pentecost representing to us as believers. We have encountered the power of His Spirit. Yeah. We've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. But yeah. brothers and sisters, there is something beyond just an encounter with the Holy Ghost. There is another feast. And 
what gets these sinners around is God's people yes. growing up, and it also centers around a great harvest. Yes. And I say all that to say that we, prophetically speaking, as the church, as the body of Christ, again, last days, all that kind of stuff, I don't know. But I do know that the church has come through an age of Passover yeah. where there was a lot of emphasis put on everybody being saved yeah. and born again, yeah. and rightly so. Yeah. Then the church was introduced to the ways of Pentecost, yeah. and there was a lot of emphasis put on healing, the gifts of the Spirit, yeah. the movement of the Spirit, yeah. and rightly so. But yeah. now we stand in a day yeah. where God is putting a demand on His people to grow up yeah. because there is a harvest out there yeah. like never before. Yeah. And so as we begin to talk about the flow of this river, you, we are looking at it as something just beyond the feast of Pentecost. Yeah. We're looking at a river that flows from a group of people that have grown up in the things of God. If you believe not right about it, you ought to shout it. Yeah. This statement was made about the river flowing, and I feel the Holy Spirit. And I'm really just kind of trying to ease into this right here. But this statement is made about the river flowing out of our bellies yeah. or our innermost being through the context of tabernacles. What that says to me is that a mark or an indicator in our lives as believers that we are maturing. Yes. Is that we have shifted gears from the spirit just flowing to us oh 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 to the spirit flowing through, through us. Yes. That's how you know that you've grown up a little bit. Yes. That it ain't all just about you. Oh it ain't God. all about what you receive from God. Oh it's not just about you coming to church and you getting your own. It's not coming about you and you and you and you and you and you Oh, give me, give me. That's the church. I come here to get my blessing. Well, I did too. But I didn't come here just to get. I come here to get something. To let that river flow. The reason we will discover this a little bit later on, the river, the reason we must allow the river to flow is that this river brings life everywhere it goes. And brothers and sisters, if there has ever been a day where the river of life needs to be released to humanity in our country, in the nations of the world, there is so much death surrounding us. There must be a people in God that have grown up to the point that says this ain't just all about what I can get to me. Now there's something I want you to notice here. The scripture says in verse 38, Jesus says, he that believeth on me, notice, as the scripture has said. Right. Yeah. Out of his belly oh, shall flow rivers of living water. Yeah. Now I want to work on this just for a moment. And I was talking to pastors about this a little bit this morning. That there is this huge thrust amongst the church to discredit the scriptures. Amen. But Jesus says the people that the river is going to flow from. Is people that have believed on him. That word. Come on now. As the scriptures have said. Come on now. If you don't believe on him. Based upon what the scripture is saying. There will be no flow out of your life. And I've seen it over and over. These churches that want to try to change the scripture. To fit their view. Or their narrative of God. There's no flow. There's no flow of life. There's no reproduction of life. There's no reproduction of saints. There's no fruit that is manifesting. Why? When we get away from believing on Him as the Scripture has said, what begins to happen is we dam up the flow. This book is the inspired Word of God. And brothers and sisters, I have been in 
this now, walking in ministry 20, almost 26 years, grew up in the church my entire life, then become a Bible student until I was around 19 and started walking with God. Even though I grew up in the church, I was not no Bible student. I was your typical child. I was your typical uh, wild teenager. All of those, those kind of things. And thank God that I had an encounter with God that began to revolutionize my life. And there was this insatiable hunger. The moment that I had that genuine encounter, there was this insatiable hunger that rose up in me for the Word of God. At this particular time, Shannon and I, we were dating. We, we wasn't married yet. We were dating. Uh, we got married when we were 21. We started dating when we was... Uh, 19, right, 19 years old, we started dating. And uh, so when it wasn't long into our dating period, I don't know how long, six, nine months, whatever, uh, that we both just had encounters with God. And so until we got married, it wasn't that Shannon was just dating me, she was dating me in a Bible. Yeah. 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 And she'll tell you everywhere I went, I had the Bible. I, I, when I would go over to see her and hang out with her and go to her mama's house and after a while of hanging out, maybe her and her mom would get to doing something or talking about something or, you know, being entertained, whatever. I would go down, I'd slip downstairs, and I'd go down there and lay on their couch downstairs and prop my feet up, and I'd get my Bible. Amen. Sitting there reading my Bible. Yeah. I would take scriptures that I would write on pieces of notebook paper that I would cut up in about three-inch uh, sections, and, and I would strip them here in about three different pieces, something like that. And uh, I would stick it up where my speedometer is in my truck. And that way, every red light I stopped at, I was looking at the Word of God. <laughs> every traffic jam I got into, I was looking at the Word of God. Now, I'm not saying all this to, you know, put a, a spiritual feather in my cap. But what I'm saying to you is that I am living proof that when you live with that kind of regard... And hunger for the scriptures, what begins to happen is that it creates a flow to come up out of your life. I don't stand in the places I stand because I disregard this book. I have stood in the places I've stood and will continue to stand in greater places as I regard this book. And I said all that to say this. We live in a time... That if we find verses in here that doesn't fit our narrative of God, oh that somehow we want to try and change the scripture because of our lack of understanding. Yeah. And what begins to happen is we're damning up the blood. Yes, we are. Come on, we're damning up the blood. Truth, right? Now let me say something to you. I believe with every single fiber of my being that God is love. Amen. First John 4 verse 8. He that loves God, know what God, God for God is. Love's not a feeling. It can Amen. manifest in feelings. Love's Amen. not an emotion. It can manifest in emotions. But love is a supernatural force because it is a person. Yeah. And his name is Jesus. Name is Jesus. See, that will really help you in marriage. Because there's going to be times when the feelings ain't there. The emotions ain't there. Right. In 26 years, I guarantee you, there'll be times that she ain't felt like right. being married to me. Oh, wow. <laughs> right, Come on now. Right. She ain't right. felt all lovey-dovey, you know, lovey-dovey, all that kind of stuff. But see, but because she had a living, loving relationship with God yes. and had a connection to the very source of love, That's right. the power of that source Trump any kind of emotions or feelings, good or bad, that could be there. And when you get that revelation in a marriage, what it does is it solidifies you in covenant. Yeah. 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 There, there's a lot I can say right there. A lot I can say. I said all that to say this. I believe God's love. Yes. I believe in grace. I believe in mercy. Yeah. And I believe God is far more graceful than what we have understood Him to be. But what is tripping people up in the church world is when they come across scriptures that don't fit their new covenant perspective Amen. of God, Amen. then all of a sudden it must have been mistranslated. Oh, there must be some kind of error there. That must have just been the viewpoint of the people and they missed the inspiration of the Spirit. That is garbage. Amen. That is foolish. There is no problems with the Bible. Our problem is understanding the Bible. Never a problem with the scriptures, it's our understanding.
understanding right. That's right. of the scriptures that become the problem. Right. Now, I really want to hone in on that idea because if we want to be a people that have a flow. Yes. Yes. Come on, Come on. sir. Absolutely. Life everywhere we go. Everywhere we go. If we want this river flowing up yes. out of us, yes. Jesus said, He that believeth on me as the yes, scriptures has seen. Yes. That's the man's belly. That's right. That's the man from his innermost being. Yes. There will be a river yes. that flows. Yes. And so it's important to Thank stay in close proximity to the word. Hallelujah. Because the word Amen. is what creates the flow. Yes, it does. Now, there's one other thing here in this text before we shift gears that I want to point out. If you get on down here in verse number 39, Jesus interprets what he's saying about the river. But this spake he of the spirit. So we don't have to wonder about what he's talking about with this river or what this river is. Am I right about it? You know, one thing I love about the Bible is that the Bible will always interpret the Bible. And this is where people get in trouble with eschatology or their end, which means end time views. Where they get in trouble with end time views is when they start trying to interpret the scriptures based upon current events. Or based upon what's going on in the world. And all of a sudden, you know, God's up to something and he's doing this and that and the end is any minute. Brothers and sisters, if I thought the end was going to be every time another war broke out over in the Middle East somewhere. Hence, we would be like most of the church live with an end time mindset. <laughs> the Bible will always interpret the Bible. And there's a clear interpretation of this river. This river, but this spake of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. Now notice, here's the line that really got in my spirit. Should receive, in verse 39, the last few lines here. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Now notice this. Because that Jesus was not yet what? Glorified. He was not yet glorified. Now this says something to me, Pastor. What this says to me is that what causes the giving of the Spirit. <laughs> I want to see if this will sink in on you before I even say it. What causes the giving of the Spirit is the glorification of Jesus. Are you tracking with me? or the historical and, and the fulfillment of the context of that scripture is talking about the glorification in the coronation of Jesus after the resurrection. Right? So he dies on a cross. He's buried. He's raised from the dead. And as he goes into the heavens, there's this heavenly coronation that takes place because the Bible said in the book of Romans that he was declared to be king or Lord by the resurrection of the dead. And so when Jesus rises up from the dead, he ascends into the heavens with his own blood to go into the most... I mean, this is this can get rich right here. To go into to the most holy, holy place. Yes. There was a glorification of yes. him that took yes. place that has a profound, that has had a profound, his sacrifice, yes. that has had a profound impact on generations. Yes. I understand that's the context yes. of the scripture. Yes. But what we know about the scripture is that the scripture is multi-passive. I believe it's Job 11 verse 6 that the Bible said the wisdom of God is double. That's right. There's a natural, historical fulfillment and connotation of the scripture. But see, it's double. Yeah. There is a spiritual right. connotation to the scripture as well. And it's like a diamond. You, you know, you can take a diamond and, and take and turn that diamond in different, uh, just a different way. And, and the different facets of that diamond will cause different uh, aspects of light to shine from it. The word of God's the same thing. It runs the same way. You, you, you can see different scriptures. You can see different uh, uh, different ideas, different revelations, and all of these kind of things out of one scripture. Let me, let me give you a simple example right here. A uh, very famous scripture that most of us, that maybe even uh, you, you may not be super familiar with the word. You probably are with this scripture. You maybe even have it 
in your house somewhere. Isaiah 40, 31. <laughs> they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. God. They shall run and not be weird, walk and not faint, all those kind of things. Now, when we think about waiting upon God, this is the result of waiting upon God. You're going to be endued with strength and power, right? Yeah. So we're sitting around and we're thinking about just waiting on God. Mm-hmm. Well, that's true at times that we must be patient. Must be time, there must be times that we learn to wait. But what if that's also saying those that wait upon me? Are you tracking with me? Yes. yes. True, two true different revelations yes. Yes. out of the same verse. That's, right. That's what makes this book so powerful. That's right. And life giving. Oh. It's full of life yeah. and revelation knowledge out of one verse. Yes. So I understand in this verse, verse 39, Jesus not yet be, being glorified. It's talking about his death, burial, resurrection, his coronation, and all of that. But here's what I also understand. That when we like when we come in this room yes. and we begin to lift him up. Yes. Come on. We begin to honor him. Yes. We begin to glorify him. Did you see what the result was? Yes. The spirit was given to us. And I am saying to you that if you want there to be a flow, you want this river not just to flow to you, but you want it to flow through you, you must stay in close proximity to the Word of God and you must live a life of worship and praise glorifying Jesus because that's how the Spirit is here. I said that's how the Spirit and more than anything else, I'm seeking Him for the Spirit to be given because Jesus said that the flesh Prophets, nothing but the words I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And when we are endued with power from on high and the Holy Ghost is moving big in our life, we bring life to others. And just like this river, we bring life to everywhere we go. Better get rid of 
this for Pastor Mike or somebody's wearing it. I'm going to get them in my mouth. <laughs> Ezekiel 47 and verse number one. Now, these, these verses as we read this may seem just a little bit kind of maybe, I hate to say boring, but sometimes we get to reading things in the Word of God, especially when we get into genealogies, so and so gets so and so and all that kind of stuff. We can kind of check out. But man, the Word of God is so full of life and prophetic language. We don't need to check out just because we kind of feel that the reading is a little bit humdrum, whatever. Look at this, Ezekiel 47. And verse 4. And afterward he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, waters issued from under the threshold of the house. Eastward. Everybody say eastward. Eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down under from the right side of the house at the south side of the altar. There's a flow from an altar. Then brought, me, then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without the utter gate, by the way that looketh eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. And he brought me through the waters. And the waters were to the ankles. It says ankle deep water. But verse 4 again, he measured a thousand cubits and brought me through the waters and the waters were to the knees. Deep. We didn't plan none of this. And he measured, we're still in verse number 4, the waters were to the knees and again he measured a thousand and brought me through. And the waters was to the loins. You get wasted now. And afterward he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over for the waters were risen, waters to swim in, a river that could not be passed over. A few more verses. And he said unto me, now I want y'all to see this right here. Son of man, have you seen this? <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. And now when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river, there were very many trees on the one side and on the other. And he said unto me, the waters issue toward the east, issue out toward the east country, and go down into where? To the desert. And they end up in the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be and it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth, whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And here's another result. There's going to be a whole lot of fishes there, brother Sam. Oh, the flow of this river is even going to enhance our fishing capabilities and lead us to more fish. There's a whole message in that, I promise. It ain't just about bass fishing neither. Because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed. And everything shall live where the river comes. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon in Getty, even unto England. And they shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds as the fish of the great sea. Exceeding many. Verse 11, last verse. But the miry places thereof and the marshes thereof shall not be healed and they shall be given to salt. Now, as you can tell, there's a lot of symbolic, a lot of prophetic language to unpack in these scriptures. 
language that there's no way in this particular setting that we can unpack. But the first thing I want you to know about this river is right off the bat, we see this is a supernatural flow. Now, the reason you can see that is that the farther this river went, the more pace and velocity it picked up. That's right. The deeper and the wider it got. And let me tell you what's supernatural about that. We see this transpiring. We see this happening. The enlargement of this river without any other tributaries flowing into it. But this is powerful right here, brothers and sisters. You think about this. If you take a water spigot and you turn that water spigot on, what happens as that water comes out? It comes out with a particular force. But the more that water travels, it loses velocity. Amen. Come on. It loses its ability, ability to infiltrate. It loses its ability to spread. It loses the ability to fill anything up. In other words, when you turn on that spigot, and at the source of that water, that's the most power that you're ever going to get out of that water. But this river right here is supernatural. Because when it's released from the source, it's not digressing as it goes. It's picking up the pace. Holy moly. It's getting deeper. It's getting wider. It's getting more grand everywhere it goes. To the point that it starts out in the flow that we're tramming around in ankle deep water. But you get another thousand cubits. A cubit was around 18 inches, so you can do the math on that. It's really not that far when you begin to think about it. 18 inches times a thousand. It really haven't, hasn't traveled that far. But yet, it picks up enough uh, velocity and force and enough bulk where all of a sudden you ain't just ankle deep, but now you're knee deep. You go a thousand times 18 inches more. And all of a sudden, you're waist deep. You go just a little bit farther, and the next thing you know, you can swim in this thing. That is the simple I hope I can communicate this, what I'm feeling in my spirit right here. I'm saying to you that as a believer, the river of God that ought to be flowing out of your life, the more you're into this thing, and the more this thing flows, you ought not be getting less and less and more shallow and shallow. It ought to be getting bigger and wider and deeper in every single aspect. Let me say to you this way. Your first day with Jesus should not have been your best day. translations and study this a little bit deeper, uh, geographically speaking, the way this river is flowing, it ends up in what the King James again uses the word sea, but this sea is the salt sea, which we know to be the Dead Sea, right? Yep. right? Yeah. Geographically speaking, this river is flowing from the temple in Jerusalem, yes. right? That's the natural picture yes. here, right. from the temple in Jerusalem through the desert winding up into the Dead Sea or the Salt Sea. Yeah, oh, here's the word I want you to see right here. Then he said unto 
going to be these waters pour out to the eastern region and go down into, look at this right here, Araba, the Jordan Valley, and on into the Dead Sea. And when they shall enter to see the sea of putrid waters, the waters shall be healed and made fresh. Now see, what this river is doing, it is defined everything we know in the natural that's right. I mean, I feel the power of God here, but my hands are shaking. It's defined everything we know in the natural. The, the flow and the velocity of it picking up, it's defined everything we know. Because all other water sources are less. There is other outside tributaries coming into it. They're decreasing, not increasing. But this river is totally opposite. That's right. It defies the natural because as it goes down into Araba, when you look at this region right here, it's talking about in the Jordan Valley, it's nothing but a desert. There's very little plant life there. There's hardly nothing that grows there. But what marked me about this story is that when I read on down in the latter part of what we read, Ezekiel saw trees lined up on both sides of the way. What's that mean? This river flowing out of your life can cause stuff to sprout up in the deadest places in your life. Where it looks like there's death there. Where it looks like there's no hope there. Where it looks like nothing can grow there. Where it looks like there's no increase there. Just turn the river loose on it. Because when you turn the river loose on it, supernatural things begin to sprout up and grow. It's divine the natural in every sense of the word and regard because it ends up in the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is somewhere around 1,300 feet below sea level and is marked as one of, if not the lowest place on the earth. Now think about that. The lowest place on the earth. Uh, a, lot, a lot of uh, scholars say that the Dead Sea is eight times saltier than any ocean on the planet. And as a result of that today, you go into this region, there was no life in that. I heard one preacher say that he got into the Dead Sea and there's so much salt and minerals in the Dead Sea that's impossible to drown in it. There's so many salts and minerals is that if you just let yourself go in the water, you begin to rise up, you can't even sink in it. It's so full of salt and minerals. And as a result, there's no fish there. There's no life there whatsoever. Until. <laughs> until. This river that flows from the most holy place. The innermost being. The inner portion of the temple of Jerusalem. When that river gets there. The lowest. The most dead. Dried up, impossible, hopeless situation. God said, "Watch this." Yeah. I'm a little yeah. 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 Say this. There may be some folk in this room that think that Stanley County is dried up. Come on now. Come on. You may think there's not a lot of hope for change in this county, but if there be a house in the county that rises up. Releases the flow of this river. This county and these communities are going to be teeming with life on a level you've never seen before. I'm here just to breathe prophetically over this house and tell you that God says that there's a river that's going to begin to flow out of this house on a greater level that's going to bring life and to the deadest places. The darkest places of this community, the most addictive places in this community, right here comes the river. Out of the people, right here, in this house, son of man, have you seen this? Oh, come on. Woo, come on. For gospel, have you seen this? Have you seen this? 
that the greatest days of this church are ahead of it. The greatest days of this county and this community are ahead of it. Because there is a people that has stayed in close proximity to Jesus in His Word. And as a result, there's a river that is flowing. I know it's already flowing here. I got it flowing when I came in. But it's going to pick up the pace. I really believe that about this house. It's going to pick up the pace. I'm going to close with this short little story right here. I come across another little story here recently about a what is now a ghost town in the United States called Rodney, Mississippi. At one time, Rodney, Mississippi used to be the most happening, prosperous port town in the United States of America because of it being in close proximity to the Mississippi River. 19, or in 1828, when this town was incorporated, it lacked three votes for being the capital of Mississippi. Jackson beat it out by three votes. And because of its close proximity to the Mississippi River and the people that had come into this town, there was one particular individual that had come into the town and had noticed all of the fertile farmland that surrounded it because of the river. He bought the whole town. He bought the whole town and he changed the name of the town from the Little Gulf. And the reason they called it the Little Gulf is that it was the little sister of the Big Gulf, New Orleans. And he changed the name of it to Rodney, Mississippi because a judge, a magistrate, who was a real close friend of his and a mentor, had had such a profound influence in his life, he named the town after him. And I guess if you buy a city, you can call it what you want, right? <laughs> so he, he renamed the city Rodney, Mississippi. Got into the 1840s and yellow fever hit. And yellow fever decimated that community. People began to flee the city as a result of so many people dying in the community. And by somewhere around 1847, the late 1800s, the yellow fever had died down. So people began to move back into Rodney, Mississippi. By the time you got into the 1850s, the population of this town had grew from hundreds to thousands. There was a dentist office there. There were multiple banks there. There was hotels there. I mean, this was a happening, thriving city in the United States of America. Marked for commerce. Great prosperity in the city. Again, primary, primarily linked to agricultural prosperity in that particular region, cotton. But something began to happen that changed that city. That literally turned the city today. If you went there, there's one road in, one road out. It's a ghost town. Hardly nobody lives there any longer. And something happened that caused that. What began to happen was over the years... The Mississippi River began to alter its course. To where, where at one time, where Rodney, Mississippi was right up against the Mississippi River, it has moved now to where it's over two miles away from that city, the Mississippi River. Has. And most scholars believe that the reason that happened is that as a storm happened here, it would rise there, and a storm here, that there was all of this different uh, debris that would begin to, to flow in. Uh, sediment would begin to, to build up. Things would begin to come into that river that altered the flow of it. And all of a sudden, a teeming, thriving, prosperous community that was in close proximity to the river, once that was gone, it began to die. Begin to lose its prosperity. In return, it lost its prominence. And it became a ghost town. Now, brothers and sisters, I would like to believe that you guys can see a very clear picture in that. That as long as we're in close proximity to the river, 
Come on, there's life there. There's prosperity there. There's blessing there. But see, there's, there's healing. There's healing there. I wish I had more time to work on that. There's healing there. But when the storms of life come, and we allow the debris that comes as a result of that, the sediment to settle in our life instead of just going ahead and dealing with it and getting it out. What it begins to do if we're not careful is that it shifts us farther and farther <laughs> away from the river. I feel this in the Holy Ghost. That there's people in this room that there was a particular time in your life that you experienced exactly what we're preaching about, singing about, and talking about. There was a flow in your life. But storms have come. Trials, tribulations, circumstances you went through that deposited things in your life that you just normalized. You just normalized. You, you just thought it was normal to be there. Mm -hmm. I heard a preacher friend of mine say one time he's always amazed by what uh, even church folk, just folk call it normal. And he said, you know, if, if the popo's got to show up to every family you, reunion you have, pretty good chance that ain't normal. That's right. That is your It's not normal. That's right. And there's dysfunctional things. Yes. That's right. That come into all of our lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times those places of dysfunction come there because we're in some kind of storm mm -hmm. or some kind of dark moment right. mm -hmm. in our lives. Jesus. Mm -hmm. and things will be deposited. If we're not careful, mm -hmm. we will embrace as being normal. Mm -hmm. but brothers and sisters, I know from I know this from experience in my own life that when things come that is altering the flow of the river in our lives and we settle for that and call it normal Jesus. Mm. Right. Come on, that's right come that's on right. loose us away from our life it source sure that's right. and I don't know what you've embraced in your life that come as a result of hard times or storms that you just thought, it'll always be this way. Mm -hmm. It'll never change. I'll never change. God wants to restore the flow. That's yeah, right. Amen. That's right. I feel it in my own life that there is a, a pickup of the river. <laughs> it's picking up pace, brother. It's picking up pace, and as a result, we've, we've resolved, this woman and I, that everywhere we go, we're going to bring life. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Let Rodney, Mississippi, be a precautionary tale to us all. That if we lose our close proximity mm -hmm. to the presence of God, miss the church service here, miss the service there, prayer meeting oh. here, Bible study there, God's not mad at me. All that is absolutely the truth. But what and who you're in close proximity to matters. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Matters. If somebody would, maybe the piano, the guitar, you can one. Uh, Pastor already told you that uh, we're going to have a service tonight. And I want to encourage you to come back tonight. We'll be more intentional to lay hands on people and pray for people and prophesy to people and all of that, those kind of things. And the pastor senses some kind of different flow this morning. I'll, I'm his guest. We'll do whatever he feels like in the spirit. But right now, I just want to pray for us corporately. If you would just. Bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. Father, today, as we have been in this awesome environment, Lord, in the 
the spirit, we've been able to take a swim. It's helped me. I thank you for it. Lord, as I've stood here from my innermost being to the very best of my ability, allow the river to flow. I'm trusting, Lord, that it has brought life to every single individual under the sound of my voice. But, Lord, I know that you don't give a word like this without great intention. That there's people in this house that has allowed things to come into their lives that has got them away from being in close proximity to the presence of God. And Lord, to whoever that is, and in some regards, all of us in this house, every one of us in this house, we're asking you, God, for that supernatural help. That whatever the buildup may be, whatever the, the, the deposits of darkness may have been to stop the flow that in the name of Jesus we're trusting that to be removed out of our lives this morning. In Jesus' name we're trusting it. And Lord, for this great people in this room, Lord, I thank you that the river is not only released to them, but God, there is a divine flow released Everywhere this local church and everybody connected to it goes in this community, there is a release of the supernatural life of God. Lord, I thank you for drawing us this morning, everybody in the room, in closer proximity. Lord, we're so grateful for that. Lord, lastly, thank you for not giving up on us. <laughs> Thank you for loving us. Amen. Not just where we're at, but loving us enough to bring us beyond where we're at, not leave us there. Lord, I know that the people in this room, they've opened their hearts and minds this morning and walk out of here changed because of the flow of the river of God. And in the name of Jesus, we thank you that it is released on our life Amen. and through our lives. Name. Now, do, do me a favor, just real quick, real quick, if you would. Just, just stretch across the aisle or get, get somebody close to you. Just put your hand on their shoulder. Put, put your hand on their shoulder. Or their back, just whatever's most, most comfortable. Just grab their hand, whatever. Just a point of contact is all we need. You know, there's a scripture that talks to us about about the gift of God that Timothy has being stirred up within him by the laying on of hands. Yes. This morning for time's sake, again, we'll, we'll be more intentional tonight to do this. But everybody in the room is having hands laid on them. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, as we lay our hands on our brothers and our sisters, we thank you that there is a divine flow of life in Jesus' name. Healing in people's bodies. Encouragement is rising up. Okay. And the increase of the river. An increase in the river. The flow of God out of their life. And we thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in every individual's life in this room. There's a mighty release of your flow. In Jesus' mighty name, all of God's people shout it. Amen. Amen.
tell you this much, Brother Danny. I know that when, mm -hmm. I didn't know what you was going to preach. We hadn't even talked about that, but I will tell you this. I will never look at a river. <laughs> I'm, talking about, I'm, I'm talking about a spiritual river. Mm -hmm. right. I will never look at the river <laughs> in the same way that I've been looking at it. We can't. After you hear this word right here, it transitions you to another level. And I just thank God. I thank God for the word in this place. Thank God for the man and woman of God. Amen. 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 We give God praise to you, everyone. Today is homecoming. We do have a meal over there, and I have lots. Lots. And, uh, so we 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 want you to we want you to stay with us, fellowship with us, and 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 uh, celebrate this day with us today. Amen. Of of the history of this house. And because if it wasn't for God, it wouldn't be here to start. That's right. And we just thank God for you. So, Angie, I'm gonna ask you. You need to go there. You need to go there. Okay, board Brother Mike. Brother Mike, you come. And Brother Danny, we're going to walk out. Me, you, and your wife, we're going to walk out. <laughs> and uh, I just thank God for you. Be back here tonight at 6 o'clock. Brother Danny will be springing the word to you. And I'm looking forward to the night, too. Amen.